woman here is Saka Kawia. She was just 12 years old when she was abducted, taken from her family, and sold into slavery. We have more about Saka Kawia in this video. First, the year is 1803. President Thomas Jefferson, the third president, negotiated a treaty with France for the Louisiana Purchase. The question now is what did the Louisiana Purchase actually purchase? Jefferson wanted to know more about the geography west of the Mississippi. Was there really an all-water route to the Pacific somewhere out there to be discovered? So Jefferson asked Congress to appropriate funds for an expedition of discovery. The leader of the expedition would be a 27-year-old Army veteran, Meriwether Lewis, a man Jefferson knew well. He was the president's personal secretary. Meriwether Lewis then chose as his co-leader, William Clark. Clark had served under President George Washington during the Whiskey Rebellion in 1794. Congress put the army in charge of the expedition. Even for a young nation, the army was a national institution with nationwide resources. Heading out to the western frontiers of an unknown and dangerous territory, Captain Lewis went to the U.S. Army Arsenal at Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, where he was issued the guns and munitions for the expedition. The men would be volunteers from frontier army posts. Lewis next went to Pittsburgh to take delivery of three custom-made boats. One was a large 55-foot flat-bottomed keel boat. There were also two smaller 22-foot boats known by their French names, pirogues. Captain Lewis and his men took the boats down the Ohio River. Just upstream from Louisville, Kentucky, they shot the Ohio Rapids, continued on down to the Mississippi, and then up to St. Louis in the Indiana Territory. At the junction of the Mississippi and the Missouri Rivers, the men of the Corps of Discovery constructed their winter quarters at a place called Camp River Dubois. That winter of 1803-1804, the Corps of Discovery had requisitioned and loaded more than two tons of supplies preparing for their springtime departure up the Missouri River. This is an exact reproduction of the Lewis and Clark keelboat. We count over 30 schoolchildren on deck. There was plenty of room for 10, 20 oarsmen, men who could also use poles to push the boat ahead. First Meetings with Native Tribes Leaving Camp River Dubois in May of 1804, the expedition headed up the Missouri River. All 35 men and their supplies were in three boats and nine canoes. Soon the expedition's daily hunting party came across two Missouri Indians. Lewis and Clark invited their chief to come to the river for a council. As the Missouri delegation approached, the soldiers came to attention, shouldered their arms, dressed right, and passed in review. The two captains wore their regimental dress uniforms. Lewis distributed the peace medals shown here. The council closed with a demonstration of the expedition's air cannon. Lewis quickly fired off five rounds in succession into a nearby tree. The Missouri were impressed. Tragedy soon struck the expedition on August 20th when Sergeant Charles Floyd died of what is believed to be a ruptured appendix. Of the many wounds and maladies experienced by the expedition during their 8,000 mile journey, Sergeant Floyd was the only fatality. Floyd is buried on the highest hill near Sioux City, Iowa. Next, the Sioux Nation. The expedition next met the peaceful Yankton Sioux. Afterwards, they met the not-so-friendly Teton Sioux. The Tetons had a reputation for harassing and intimidating traders, demanding payment of tolls. At council, two of the three Teton chiefs complained that their gifts were inadequate. They demanded the Americans stop their upriver progress or at least leave with them one of the pirogues loaded with gifts. When casting off, both Lewis and Clark sensed trouble from the well-armed Sioux warriors lining the banks of the river. 
Teton Chief Black Buffalo, realizing that they could not keep the expedition from leaving, ended the confrontation and allowed the boats to pass. In late October, the expedition reached the junction of the Missouri and Knife Rivers, roughly 1,600 miles up the Missouri from Camp River Dubois. The Mandan lived in earthen lodges. These dome-shaped houses are made of logs, covered with willow branches, grass, and mud. In the center of the village are these representations of Mandan gods. Most Plains Indians are nomadic. They move with the seasons and the buffalo. The Mandan stayed put. This is the inside of a Mandan lodge. This ceremony is called the final race. These young men, after five days of fasting and competitions to prove their worthiness for battle, were required to pass this ultimate test. This is a rain dance. Here, a Mandan warrior chants, dances, yells and screams for an entire day. The Mandan had five villages located near each other. Note in this village, the vegetable garden on the left, while on the right, fish are smoked and dried. The cross games were played just outside the village walls. The Mandan also enjoyed horse races. This is a warrior who through self-torture is offering up his pain as a sacrifice for the entire community. He is skewered and fixed to a rope. The men of the expedition built their quarters about two miles from the Mandan villages. The, this fort consisted of two converging rows of rooms with storage at the apex and a watch post in the center. For security, the captains mounted the swivel cannon from the bow of the keelboat inside the fort. They kept a sentry on duty at all times, refused Indians admittance after dark and kept the gate locked at night. Here is the captain's room. With navigational instruments, such as a chronograph and sextant, for precision, location determination, and accurate map making. These are the enlisted quarters. Now, the Buffalo Dance is one of the Mandan celebrations which the expedition occasionally observed. In winter, the Mandan would hunt with snowshoes. The Buffalo could not run well in the deep North Dakota snow. Sacagawea was the 16-year-old wife of a French-Canadian fur trader, Troussan Charbonneau. Sacagawea, we will see, was much more than a teenage bride. The captains hired Charbonneau as a translator. His young Shoshone wife and her one-month-old baby would travel with him. The Corps of Discovery departed Camp Mandan in just two pirogues and six dugout canoes. The keelboat at this point was too large for the river ahead. Soon after leaving Camp Mandan, the men saw their first grizzly bear. At the mouth of the Yellowstone River, they saw their first moose. Up next, the Great Falls of the Missouri. The Corps next faced a grueling overland 18-mile portage up and around the Missouri waterfalls and rapids. They struggled up steep slopes in the scorching summer heat. That 18-mile portage took three weeks to conquer. A while later, they encountered the Shoshones, Sacagawea's tribe. At council that evening, Sacagawea was there to interpret. But before the meeting even began, she recognized the Shoshone chief. It was her brother, Kamiyawe. She immediately embraced him. She showed him her baby. Sacagawea had not seen her brother since she was 12, when she was abducted by Sioux warriors and sold into slavery to the Hidatsu tribe. 
The Hidatsu later sold her to the fur trader Charbonneau. That good fortune of an unexpected reunion enabled the party to secure horses and guides for their rugged journey over the Bitterroot and Rocky Mountains, the most treacherous part of their journey. The hard march across the Rocky Mountains took 11 days, during which they hiked a 200-mile stretch of mountainous terrain. They suffered from frostbite and dehydration and were pushed to the limits of their endurance. Finally, they arrived at the Nez Perces village, west of the mountains. Anxious to get to the Pacific, and aware of the fact that they were no longer in U.S. territory, the captains passed out medals and gifts to the Nez Perces chiefs, explained their mission, and requested assistance in building canoes for the expedition. On September 7th, the expedition began its journey down the Clearwater, Snake, and Columbia Rivers. One canoe capsized, and Sacagawea saved some irreplaceable journals. One month later, they spotted the Pacific Ocean. Great joy in camp, Clark wrote in his journal. We are in view of the ocean, this great Pacific Ocean, which we have been so long anxious to see. That winter was miserable. Of the 112 days the expedition was at Fort Clasip, it rained every day, except 12. The men suffered from being constantly wet and cold. Captain Lewis spent most of his time writing in his journal. This is one of his zoological entries. Captain Clark, he worked on his maps including the first ever map of the land between the Dakota Territory and the Pacific Ocean. Heading home, the expedition of discovery left Fort Clatsop on March 23, 1806. In early May, they reached their old friends, the Nez Perce. The Nez Perce demonstrated their hospitality by feeding and taking care of the expedition. The Nez Perce would be their guides crossing back over the mountains. Heading back to the Missouri River, Lewis and Clark split the expedition in two so they could explore two different routes around the Great Falls. While Clark's group took the Yellowstone River back to the Missouri, Lewis and his group are seen here crossing the Clark Fork River on their way back. After Clark and Lewis were back together, they headed down the Missouri River. They would finish the trip in less than one year. The outbound trip had taken twice as long. The Lewis and Clark expedition has become famous as an epic of human achievement. Although the expedition didn't find an uninterrupted direct water route to the Pacific as Jefferson had hoped, the Corps did strengthen the nation's claim to the Pacific Northwest. If you would like more on America's Western expansion, we have other videos exploring the subject. Check it out.